And let us begin. Welcome everybody to our seeming like a uh, weekly uh, New York Giants Preservation Society meeting. Um, Yay. Yay. Before I go any further, um, let me just, it, it, I don't want you to think I'm rude when I keep on moving things around because I have a lot of people to admit, things like that. Um, first of all, Jim Folkerts, thank you so much for this lovely shirt that you uh, donated to me. It's beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, you know, the Yankees, uh, Derek Jeter was known as the captain. And there's somebody here tonight who was my softball captain, who I just reconnected with about 45 years ago. Sam Rosemary, thank you so much for coming. You made my night, and I really mean that. And Sam, you could vouch for me. Me as a little 10 or 10 or 12 year old, always had my giant cap on in Monticello. Was that I, I will vouch for him and I'm not gonna monopolize, but I'll just say there was a stretch for 18 years where uh, the National League won 17 of 18 All-Star games. And yep. every year where we were for the summer, Gary and I only watched uh, TV once, once the entire summer, kids like us. And you know what it was? It was the All-Star game. Correct. And I had to suffer as a Yankee fan for 17 of those 18 years because <laughs> Gary, God bless him, he was San Francisco, so I didn't, it didn't bother me as much. But as bad as the Mets were, every year they could lord over me at the All-Star game. Sorry, <laughs> Gary. But wait, so Gary, I have to tell you one more thing. Gary was the second baseman. I'm now a second baseman still in my 60s. And Gary was scrappy. He was good. He was intelligent. And, and now I know he has an encyclopedic memory for what we did back then. He can tell the scores and actions in games. I'm not surprised he's the leader of a nice group like this. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Sam, you'll always be my captain. So, <laughs> all right. Um, other business to uh, tend to. Uh, next week we have Dr. Uh, Larry Hogan. Uh, he is a incredible historian on Major League Baseball especially the Negro Leagues. He'll be discussing, uh, you know, the statistic issue. Also the Giants in the, um, who played in the Negro Leagues. And he'll be talking about, great book, uh, So Many Seasons in the Sun, all of the um, baseball clubhouse men. And hopefully Ed Logan will be there because his father is one of the guys. Uh, Pete Cheehy, the Yankees, uh, Mike Murphy, Fred Logan, so that'll be a great thing. Um, following that, we have Alex Drew, who I spoke to today on the phone. He wrote this fabulous new book, 26 in a Row, uh, just released during this COVID thing, so uh, he'll be discussing that. The following week, we start February with uh, Perry Barber. Perry uh, is a uh, giant enthusiast, knows everything about Christy Matthewson, uh, when you get her um, no, uh, a little bio that I put together, I put down umpire. I didn't want to put female umpire. She doesn't like that. So. <laughs> she's she, incredible. She, she, she's and Jeopardy champion, sang with Bruce Springsteen, just incredible lady. And then uh, middle of February, Dave Lipman, who was a contributor, as Stu was, to uh, the team that uh, – Nobody will forget the 1951 New York Giants. So, uh, these tonight, are all Thursdays, right, Gary? Thursday, all Thursday, Thursdays, Thursday. yeah, and all seven o'clock uh, Eastern time. Tonight, uh, I was able to contact uh, Bill Rigney's son, Tom Rigney, who uh, shouldn't even be called Bill, Bill Rigney's son. He he lives on his own merit. He's a famed San Franciscan. Uh, musician uh and he will be speaking about his father besides talking also a bit, little bit about his career as a as a fiddler and his group uh tom my dad always referred to you as as the cricket and that's that's how i was born uh, knowing you and my dad was a huge new york giant fan but he, he would always say the old cricket the old cricket oh, the old cricket let's give it up for tom rigney Hey. All right. All right. Thank you, Gary, Gary asked, you asked for this, Gary. So Yes, I did. <laughs> so here <laughs>
He's also a musician. For those of you who are not San Francisco Giants, bye bye baby. Wonderful. Time. Well, I'm I'm very I'm very pleased to be here. Thanks so much, uh, all of you, for inviting me for thinking of this. And uh, honestly, until Gary got in touch with me, I had no idea this organization even existed. So I'm delighted to find you guys. Oh, good. The floor is all yours. If you want to talk about your time, first of all. Uh, Tom's dad, of course, I'm sure all of you know, was the last New York Giant manager and the first San Francisco Giant manager. And he also took a spell when the team was being sold, I think more or less as a favor to the Giant organization for one year. Yeah. And I don't think he wanted to manage anymore. He also worked for the California Angels. And uh, Tom, the floor is yours. I'm not going to uh, take any more time. Well, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure uh, even where to begin. Uh, you know, I, uh, my connection, of course, with the New York Giants, uh, I was fairly young at the time, um, but I remember I have incredibly vivid memories of the Polo Grounds and, and those, those teams, um, you know, particularly uh, that little cutout in straightaway center field where the clubhouses were. That was my, my brother, Bill, who was two years older than I, uh, and I, that was our, that was our playground during batting practice and uh, before the games, every, t every time we could convince dad to take us to the park. So I have just, you know, incredible memories of being out there and occasionally well, occasionally Marv Grissom, who would be out there and who was a, you know, a really nice guy, would kind of look over his shoulder and see us playing catch back there in that uh, little cutout. And he'd say, you know, come on out, guys, come on out, you know, and, right. and chase, chase a fly ball or two. This was when I, well, I'm, I was born in 47. So, um, you know, this one, I was like six, seven, eight, nine years old. But there were a few occasions, and this is a memory that just really sticks in my head, uh, when Willie, who, you know, owned that center field in the polo grounds, would look over his shoulder and see us back there and go, hey, little Riggs, come on out, come on out, you know, and we'd get to stand next to Willie Mays, and if there was anything he didn't feel like running after, he'd kind of give us the nod and we could chase a ball off into the corner or something. And, you know, when I, when I think about that, it's just such an insane memory at the time. You know, you're a kid. You don't know, you don't know that your life is so different from any of your friends' lives. Uh, but certainly, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, I can see that my upbringing was not exactly typical. Um, you know, uh, I... Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure. You know, people ask me, of course, I, I've, I've had a long career as a musician and, and band leader, and, uh, and people wonder how I ended up in music with a father who was so not only successful and accomplished and famous and beloved in, in professional sports. And... Uh, I always say that, that the um, they have to hit the space bar. My my dad's example was never, son, come here, you should do what I do. Go out, you know, get a glove and a bat, and 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 we'll make you a ball player. Watching my father over all of the years of my upbringing, it was really easy to see that he loved everything about what he did for a living. He loved everything about the game of baseball and. And he had mastered all sorts of aspects of it. And the lesson and the message to me was, well, that's what you want to do. You find something that you love to do that much. And then don't be, uh, you know, don't be put off by the difficulties or, or whatever it was. You know, you, you find something you feel that strongly about. And then you don't let anything stand in your way 
of doing that as your, you know, as your profession. So I think that was the big lesson I got from him. His pretty unlikely story, you know, uh, like me, he was a very late bloomer. He couldn't play on the high school baseball team because he was too small. And it was only when he was a senior that he was finally, you know, he finally grew enough to actually make the team. And, you know, I have to think that being rejected, even though he had the skill, but he didn't have the physical development yet, probably just pissed him off, you know, and, and that that's what created some of that will to, you know, to succeed uh, in such a rarefied world as, as professional baseball. So, you know, when I looked for something to do, uh, you know, you, you, when you introduced me, you said, oh, our guest tonight is the son of Bill Rigney. Well, that haunted me my entire life. It was the most interesting. Everyone else in the world thought that was the most interesting thing about me was that I was Bill Rigney's son. And, uh, and for someone, let's say, with an ego like mine, that was not an acceptable way to go through life. So I really felt when I found music and started to pursue it, I really felt that I was moving as far as possible out of my father's shadow, you know, and it wasn't that I necessarily had to be in the public sphere, although it turned out that appealed to me. Uh, but I just had to be, I had to be away from his reputation and his success and all of that. So music seemed to suit me. And it was only years later that dad and I realized that we were essentially both in the same field the performing arts, you know, on some level. And not only that, but I as a band leader and he as a manager had essentially the same job. And it was quite a moment of reckoning for us to go, oh my God, here we thought we were nothing alike and, and that I had taken this, you know, absurd path to try to become a, a professional musician. And we had both ended up really, uh, yeah in a very similar position. So that, that's, that's kind of the, in a nutshell, the story of my connection uh, with his profession. But I have lots of memories of... Uh, uh, you know. Well, one of the... Tom, one of the where did you guys live things. when you were in New York? You know, you we never lived in New York. Uh, we always lived in the Bay Area. But when school was, <laughs> my mom would pack the three of us up and off we would go to New York uh, and we'd stay the summer. We, uh, the most memorable places I remember were in Bronxville. I, can, I have really okay. vivid memories of a house in Bronxville that my folks you know, rented uh, for at least two years. I think maybe that was 56 and 57. Um, and I, you know, I mean, I have, I have memories of Manhattan, but I don't think we actually lived there. I think they always have found someplace out in the boroughs to, uh, you know, find it. Because it's interesting. The daughter of Mel Ott is on this Zoom call. Oh. And the first time I spoke to her, I asked her the same question. And she basically had the same answer. They were from Louisiana. That was their home. When they were in New York, they rented an apartment, much like you did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. so, you know, I, I, think, I think my parents didn't want to have, you know, our family life completely uprooted by dad's professional life. And quite frankly, I think he preferred that too, you know. <clears throat> it's a very intense life, being on the road, all of that stuff. It's, it's tremendously disruptive of normal life, which I know from my own profession. And I think they preferred to keep the home in the Bay Area in California, where we all were born and all had lived, and uh, just we would travel for the summers. So, a few summers in New York, a couple in Minneapolis uh, when he was when he managed the Millers before coming back to manage the Giants. Uh, then uh, out to San Francisco, which was amazing. That was the only time I ever had kind of been around my dad in the summertime. Uh, was when the Giants moved to San Francisco. 
So that was great. Then LA, then Minnesota, Minneapolis again with the twins and then back to the Bay Area. And he spent, I, I'm assuming you're probably aware, he spent the last 15 years of his life working for the A's and, and never retired. So. Um, this is, I'm in Minneapolis and you just kind of answered that. So it sounds like you did spend, the family was out there in uh, 54, 55. Yes. When he managed the Millers and just where, where did you live? Uh, memories of Nicollet Park. Were you already back in California? when the Millers won the, the Junior World Series? No, no, that was, that was the, uh, we lived in a little suburb called Edina. Is that right? Is yeah, that, it's that the to Tony yeah. suburb. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I remember that park. I remember dad putting himself in as a pinch hitter in the ninth inning and hitting a home run. You know, he was kind of a, had a sort of player manager designation. And I can remember thinking, what? You know, it's like two runners on, bottom of the ninth. You know, he's looking around and he's saying, who the hell can win this game for us? And he, and he, and he said, oh, maybe I can. And he grabbed a bat and went up and parked one and won the game. I mean, that's a really vivid memory of that, uh, that season. So it's possible that when the, when the season ended, we were already back. When, you know, our schedule always was based on uh, when we kids had to be back in school. Just, just, in a, uh, just in a, as a side, when I spoke to Tom uh, last week and this week, on purpose I said to him, I would like him to talk about his uh, music career and, and possibly play a song because it is difficult. He, you know, he, he's on his own, not in his dad's shadow, we were going to talk about that, but I, that, that's the reason why I asked him to do a little uh, musical interview. <laughs> to, to and you guys and, know and plus, that he really is a, a famed musician now, now in, the, uh, in San Francisco. One other thing, Tom, Mo yeah. Reznor is on the call tonight. Uh, oh. He, uh, <clears throat> I, I don't know if you have his DVD, but his, your dad is speaking uh, in the clubhouse um, at the end. Uh, you know, there's a tape about moving the team. I don't know if you have that. If you don't, we'll get, we'll get you a copy. No, no, I do. And hi, hey, Mo, good, good to see you. Uh, you know, the, it's good that you brought that up because there's actually one of just a very short, but, but to the point story about that day. And when I got, Mo, when I got your video, it yeah. really, boy, it really hit me. I wasn't there on that day because we were already back in California, but I had seen the famous picture around home plate, you know, when they were doing kind of the, the ceremony and the mayor was there and I remember Hubble was there and a bunch of secretaries, everybody's in suits. And my dad is there and he's standing next to Blanche McGraw, John McGraw's widow. Yes. Um, She's got an armful of roses and Mo in your video, that shot is in the video. I see my dad either handing her the roses or, or walking out on the field with her and she's carrying the roses. But the, but the great story that, that that very dignified and ceremonious photo doesn't capture is that while they're standing there, my dad's standing next to Blanche McGraw, and he finally, you know, that somebody's speaking and they're pontificating about the great history of the Giants and blah, 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 going on and on. And dad leans over to Blanche and says, geez, you know, look at all this. What do you, what do you think John would have made of all this? And she looked at him and said, Bill, he would have been pissed. <laughs> 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 and then she pauses for a second and go and says, but Bill, he was always pissed. <laughs> that just captures McGraw True. perfectly and the moment perfectly. Bill, he'd be pissed. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he was always pissed. <laughs> anyway, so uh, when I saw, Mo, when I saw your video and saw her with the roses and dad sort of solidly standing there talking to her, I thought, God, that was that moment that, that I had heard about my whole life. And that was, you know, dad had a lot of other things to say about that day, but that was the one that really, really stuck with me. I just loved it. 
<laughs> I was on the feet all day. They let me yeah. on. It's amazing all day, and I saw Willie Mays's last uh, base hit, yeah, which you. I'm on a Zoom meeting with the Giants baseball group. Yeah, but I can't bring my great. picture up. How do I get my? my... I'm sorry. Hey, Tom, hey, Tom, trying to match up your talents with the Giants. Um, hey, did you ever link up with Tim Flannery and play any music with him? No, no, but you know who was a, you know who was a big fan of mine was Orlando. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's an interesting thing. Uh, just some of the odd connections that, that you make, you know, just because I was always sort of on the fringe of my dad's career, but occasionally I'd be playing music somewhere, <laughs> you know, where there'd be a bunch of dad's friends gathered or something like that. And, and Orlando, as many of you I'm sure are aware, was a percussionist. He was a, a conga player and, uh, yes. and, and was good. And so when he heard me play, he, God, he took me aside and we had this long conversation about music and, and, uh, and I don't know, there were, there were a bunch of, bunch of players I met over the years that I, I never played music with any, any other baseball people, but a, a number of them uh, did have a chance to hear me or hear my band play in some situation. And, you know, you it, call, it, it did forms. Did you call Orlando Cha Cha? I did. No, 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 no. I, 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 I think I called him Mr. Cepeda. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I'm a music journalist. I do jazz, is, jazz now, uh, uh, jazz times. Where could I, you know, I know the virus is here, but where would you normally perform? I, I'm sorry, that, that was breaking up a little here where I was listening. Did you ask what kinds of, what kind of music I play? Or what venues, I think he's asking. Oh, what venues? Oh, I, boy, too many to name. I've, I've been a touring, full-time touring musician for about 45 years. So I've played kind of all over the U.S., uh, all over Europe, all over Canada. Um, and it's a, it's a combination of uh, clubs and concert halls and dance halls and festivals and outdoor concerts and it, it never there's not any one venue that i particularly you know that i play all the time it's it's kind of it's kind of everywhere what's the name of your band uh, the name of my band is tom rigney and flambeau which is a, okay okay and the band plays kind of eclectic American roots music, Cajun blues, New Orleans mu uh, music, boogie woogie, rock and roll. Uh, okay. I write a lot of music, and uh, so I have a five-piece band that plays plays whatever I feel like playing. So we're, we're in San Francisco. We're in San Francisco. We're in San Francisco or the Bay Area, uh, which you uh, where your band would normally perform. Uh, you know, when I'm at home, uh, well, I live in Berkeley. Um, I play a number of clubs and theaters, say, within a hundred miles of San Francisco. Uh, you know, it's again, it's a different schedule all the time. Uh, just, uh, you know, just before things shut down, I had a show in Berkeley and I had a show out in Folsom, out east of Sacramento at a, yeah. a big theater. And yeah, anyway, it's just, uh, and then I travel a fair amount still to festivals and uh, uh, it's kind of wherever the gigs are. You, you mentioned Tom, you mentioned Cajun, you run into Michael Doucet along the way. Uh, Michael Doucet is one of my closest friends and uh, we made a record together about five years ago and right now we're in the middle of making another one. Uh, and That's interestingly, when when things shut down because of COVID, Michael had just flown out from Louisiana to play a couple of concerts with me and my band, which is something he and I do once or twice a year. And uh, we were planning to work on the new record and then play a couple of concerts. And as soon as he got off the plane, we got the phone calls canceling the concerts that were scheduled 
for that weekend. So he basically moved in with my wife and me for seven days or something while the world shut down. And the two of us just hunkered down in the studio and recorded all the fiddle tracks for the new new record. So yes, you know Michael, he's one of my I, best. I guess because I'm, I'm, for about 20 years, I dabbled in promotion. I did two shows with him. Oh. Yeah, two shows with Jose, he's a great guy. A, a great guy. Anyway, you know, swinging back to baseball, um, you know, I do have some stories if you guys are interested in them. I have a couple stories in my dad's voice and then a couple that I'd be happy to tell. I don't know. How do you want to do this? Is it Absolutely. That, Tom, why don't you do that? I think that would be great. And then uh, there'll be a Q&A. Anybody? Uh, All right. But I don't know if you know, Ed Logan is on with us today. Oh. Ed, say hello. Hi. Tom, did we Andy? know each other when we were kids? I can't remember. My God, we knew each other when we were kids. How about that? that, that Ed, that's a name from my past, I'll tell you. Well, my dad worked for your dad, you know, and so I was the last New York Giants bat boy in uh, 57. So I, I, I was, I was I there with that, uh, with that last game where your dad was with, uh, you know, with, with the lady from uh, the McGraw, past. Miss McGraw. Miss McGraw. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I remember, I remember that you were the bad boy. I, I think I was always jealous. I, I never knew how you got that. <laughs> well, my dad uh, hired the bad boys. That's for his reason. Yeah. Yeah. And by oh, the way, I, quick, I quick remember story. your dad. I remember yeah. your dad very, very well. He was one of the guys who was, who, who was so nice to my brother and me, you know, we'd be in the clubhouse just sitting around. You know? We didn't know what the hell we were doing. <laughs> But, Quick story. But, uh, when the Giants got out to uh, San Francisco in 58, I came out there and worked uh, in Seal Stadium and uh, connected with, um, uh, because I had, I had uh, just graduated from the high school of music and art and I was a drummer and uh, had, I was in several bands and wish I still was. But uh, Orlando was a, a bongo player. He had, he brought bongos into the, into the clubhouse and he he brought a record player and he was playing music and my dad said you can't have music in the in the in the clubhouse can't do that so we bonded uh, Orlando and I bonded and you know the rest is history there's been music in the clubhouse ever since that's great yeah <laughs> that's a, that's a great story well it's it's great to see you Ed and I, and I do remember you uh I might not have been able to pick you out of a lineup or anything but, uh, but one, one other yeah. thing, when I was in that summer, I, w I, pl I went down to the Black Hawk nightclub and I sat in as a drummer, a uh, jazz drummer. Wow. You know, and I was only Not like 17 years old, you know, but I was uh -huh. good. So That's I wish great. I still had my drums. Eddie, great. you're still looking great. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. I'll be 80 in uh, April. Ha. I'm, I'm 10 years to the day with uh, Willie Mays almost. Uh -huh. I'm five months older than Willie Mays. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was 16 when I was his bad boy, and he was 26. Tom, you want to give us some of your stories? Well, sure, sure. You know, um, a couple of these, uh, you know, my sister, Lynn, uh, Lynn Rigney Schott, uh, for years was writing the, the book about dad and had collected a lot of material. Um, other things kind of got in the way, particularly when he got sick and, you know, it, it, the focus of everything sort of changed. But uh, Scott Osler had done a series of interviews with dad, again, because for a while Scott was thinking of writing the book and then for whatever reason, he lost interest or moved on to a different project. But I have transcriptions of uh, a couple of the Scott Osler interviews. And th there's a couple of cool things. Uh, one of them is about his first game as a major leader. And it's just a short little thing, but it, it really captures something. Um, he, he said, and, and so this is my dad speaking. It's just been transcribed. So I'll do what I can to capture a little of the, of his inflection. He says, uh, you know, I'd never been to a major league baseball park. Hell, I'd never been to a major league city in my life. But I remember coming into the clubhouse 
We all carried our own gear. And I walked down oh, the yeah. steps and into the main room. And then down four or five steps into, into where the locker <laughs> was. And I'm looking for my locker. And I yes, finally yeah. find, there it was. Johnny Ma was dressing alongside of me. And I stood there staring. And, and now I'm thinking, holy smoke. Here's where Christy Matthewson, Bill Terry, Mel Ott, they had all dressed in this clubhouse. And now, what am I? How did I get here? So I put my bag down and I walked outside and went down the steps. And the night lights and the polo grounds were on and the big horseshoe, you could see the big horseshoe. And the immensity of this place just gave me a chill, you know, thinking, I'm going to be the shortstop tomorrow and look at this place. It's going to be filled with people. I thought if there's a God in heaven, I hope they hit the first ball to me and just let me get it over with. And the Philadelphia shortstop hit the first pitch down to my left. I went over, picked it up, threw him out, boom. And I thought, well, that was a cinch. This isn't going to be hard at all. What's wrong with this? <laughs> and then he goes on to say, so then I came up for my first at bat, struck out on four pitches. Welcome to the major leagues. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. So that's good. Anyway, uh, there, there's another story that I know all of you New Yorkers will resonate to because something that's always puzzled me, and you won't think this, but the world does, is the fact that Johnny Mize is not remembered as the hitter and player that he really was you know he was a monster but he's kind of overlooked i think when people look back at the you know the giants <laughs> and baseball of that era but he and my dad were roommates uh on the road so he uh he has a hang on let me find let me find oh yeah so he has a couple of Johnny Mize stories that I've always liked a lot because I remember Mize. He was gigantic, you know, and, and so very impressive to a little, a little kid. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he says, I remember rooming with Johnny Mize. You know, Mize was tough. He had a very, very small sense of humor, but he was a marvelous hitter. All he talked about was hitting, and he did it very, very well. On the road, you know, we played mostly day games in Chicago and, and, and John, he'd wake up and he was a cigar smoker. So he'd light a cigar first thing in the morning and then he'd go over and pull up the shade and he'd look out to whatever city we were playing in and he'd find a flag. And John knew the direction, the orientation of every baseball stadium in the National League. And he would look out and see which way the wind was blowing. And he knew that if that flag was blowing, if it was blowing out, he'd come back and he'd lie down on the bed and sit back and take a couple of puffs on a cigar and say, Rumi, I'm gonna hit one today, maybe two. Great story. <laughs> but Great story. if the wind was blowing in, He'd come back, he'd put the cigar out, and there'd be this big quiet in the room. Mm -hmm. And I used to think, boy, our pitcher better shut somebody out today because the big man isn't going deep this afternoon. <laughs> anyway, I love that. It just, anyway, th th then there's a, another story. You guys can stop me if you know this story, but this is, this is real baseball history here. Um, hang on, I got to find where it starts here. Oh no, here we go. Sorry. What happened? There's senior a moment. Yeah, my senior. Oh, I've got too many pages here, and they appear to be out of order. Hold on. You're standing. Oh, da, 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 da. Okay, anyway, sorry, I can't, I can't find the beginning of this story. Damn. I can get in here. Lose the punchline. What's that? As long as I don't lose the punchline, I know. 
No, oh, it was here. I, I saw I saw it earlier. Come on, come on. There's the there's the end of it. So where's the damn beginning of it? Come on. We could probably tell oh, you the beginning. Here we here we go. God. All right. Um, mm -hmm. So, so he's talking about he's talking about Mize and he's talking about the road. Here here it is. Uh, so we go out to dinner on the road, you know, and and John liked to have a drink of Scotch whiskey. Big deal, okay? We'd have a couple of drinks before dinner. I'd have a beer, and then maybe a beer with dinner, and that was it for me. But he always liked to have a have a couple of glasses of scotch, but he never wanted anybody to know. <laughs> now I didn't have any problem. Who cares? He kept hitting the ball over the fence, you know. Whatever he wanted to do was fine with me. Anyhow, it was about August, and we were struggling in 47, even though we finished fourth and hit 221 home runs. We broke the Yankee record by 40 home runs that year. But we had an off day in August, and Mel Ott, our manager, called for a workout. A uh, hot, muggy day in New York. So the big cat, I nicknamed the big cat, he didn't move very fast, so I called him the big cat, which I thought was kind of friendly. And because he used to say to me in the late innings when I was playing second base, I'm guarding the line. They're guarding it, you're standing on it. Come on, cat, you can move over a little more this way. Anyway, so he comes in the clubhouse for this off day workout and he got dressed and he put on a heavy wool shirt. I mean heavy. Then he put on a rubber shirt that he had had made over that. And we went out and had the workout for about two hours, you know, extra hitting and all. So we came back into the clubhouse and about four or five, as, five of us are sitting in the trainer's room talking to Doc Bowman, who was a marvelous trainer. So at this point, Big John walks into the trainer's room and he took off the rubber shirt and he wrung it out and all this sweat and water came out of it. And then he peeled off the wool shirt, which was just saturated, and he wrung that out onto the floor. And now there's a puddle of sweat and water on the floor. And he looks around at us and says, now that's what a workout's all about, you guys. <laughs> and, and I said, hey, Rumi, that's probably some of that Scotch whiskey coming out of you. <laughs> and and he, he stopped and looked at me and said, you know better than to talk like that. And then he went upstairs to the shower. So now Doc Bowman went over and got some lighter fluid and poured it in the puddle of sweat on the floor. Now we've gathered a little group in the trainer's room. And here <laughs> my roommate back down the steps after his shower. And he comes over and says, John, hey, uh, you know, the guys think that that's that scotch whiskey come out of you in your sweat. And he was shocked. And he said, no, you know better than to talk like that. And Doc Bowman says, well, there's only one way to find out. And he lights the mat and talks. <laughs> in the puddle and boom the whole thing just goes up in this explosion and Mize just he was just stunned and and and, and he, he and, and for like a month after that every day he'd pull me aside and he'd say geez I didn't know that scotch whiskey would come out in your in your sweat man I I gotta stop drinking I gotta stop drinking and now we get to the end of the season and and I I can't let him go home thinking this. So we went out after a game and I told him the story of the lighter fluid and the scotch whiskey. And at first I thought he was gonna kill me and then he wanted to kiss me. And I've never forgotten the look on that big man's face when that puddle of sweat and lighter fluid just went poof right in his face. <laughs> anyway, there's a Johnny Great Mike. story. <laughs> That's you know, good. Tom, uh, you know, Mize is in the Hall of Fame. I assume you know yeah. that. I, yeah. I know, but it's interesting to me. Now, maybe this is because the Giants have been in San Francisco so long. San Francisco Giants fans do not know much about Johnny Mize. No. You know, I, I, I've been out to San Francisco many times, and Gary, 
will know this, say the same thing. San Francisco fans are not the same as the New York fans. Yes. No. You know, we know the San Francisco history. San Franciscans do not know the New York history. That's for whatever good. reason. For whatever yep. reason, whatever reason you come up with. I met Johnny Mize at the, my first or second time in Cooperstown, Hall of Fame weekend. He was sitting next to Ray Dandridge, um, the Negro League player who never had a chance. And I remember saying to myself, boy, look at that big guy there. He's in the hall. And this other guy who was a great player never had a chance. Just happened to be that they were sitting t sitting together that time. It was yeah. a great honor just to, to meet Johnny Mize yeah. the first time I was up there. Great yeah. stories. Great stories. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I think Mike said four top five MVP finishes. So he was um, no lightweight. And that was back when Musial was in the league and stuff. I think he finished second twice and maybe third once. So he had his day. And yeah. Tom, I'll have the floor for one second. I just want to show you something we came across while cleaning out my, my father's house. I mentioned he passed away about a year ago. I, can you see this? This is the 1952 yearbook. Whoa. Yeah, take a look at this page. Let's see if we can get it here. Yep, there it is. There, can you see that? I Did can you, see it, but I can't read it. Right oh, that? there he is. Okay, yep. Wait, have a, Bill there. Rigney. Oh, there he is, leaning over there. Yeah. So, we never, never knew we had this in the house. All these years, I had no clue until last year. My father passed away. We're finding all this giant stuff, so it's been really cool. Michael, you know who the artist was on that cover? Bill Gallo. Bill Gallo. No, was not Bill Gallo. Bill Willard Mullen. Willard Mullen. It looks like William something or other. Maybe William Mullen. It's not Bill Gallo. Yeah, yeah Willard Mullen. Willard Mullen. Yeah. Mullen. That's it. Um, yeah. I got Willard one of you. Willard 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 Willard. Hang on. Let me get it in there. You recognize this picture? Look at this one. Whoa. Uh oh. Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, Tom, I have a close that's friend that God. lived in. Yeah. Is it Edina? Is that the ad, the name of the city? Yeah. E D I N A? Correct. What was the address? Oh, damned if I know. Okay. Uh, Tom, Tom uh, uh, I have yearbook. <laughs> And uh, it was also a newspaper. So either Bill Gallo will admire it for the year. I wanted to ask you, what, what was your impression about the move? Scuttlebutt, uh, scuttlebutt by players discussing the move, your father's thoughts on the move to San Francisco, and the history of the polar bear. Some knowledge of even us we were both in the same year i wonder what Mars, you really got to do something with your mic it's it's really pick up a collection for him and buy him a new mic instead of buying the cigars get yourself a mic yeah it's right i think i, I think the i got phone is horrible you get one every third word maybe it, it sounded like lesson. what my thoughts were about the move and what my dad's and some of the other players thoughts were yes. about the move yes. you know I think we had an, an unusual perspective on it because we lived in the Bay Area. For me, this was like the best thing imaginable <laughs> that dad would be home for the summer and that I could stay home for the summer too. You know, my summer vacations were very interesting, but they were always involved being packed into a, a car or an airplane right after school was out and flying across the country. Uh, so I, I remember being very excited that the Giants were moving to San Francisco. My recollection is that my dad liked the idea too, because it would just mean he was living at home for more of the year. Uh, but I honestly don't know how most of the other players uh, felt about it. There, there certainly weren't players from California on the team. So, so, we had a unique perspective on it just because this was going to mean we stayed home for the summer. But I, you know, I remember it was a big, a big deal. I have a question. Um, what uh, musician did you idolize and what style of music did you like? 
more jazz or what, what, what interests you the most? What, what interests me the most? You know, I, I, I took up the violin very, very late. I started when I was 24 years old and I had no previous musical experience. Um, the, I still am not quite clear what, the, what, what I was thinking, you know. It certainly wasn't that I intended to become a professional musician. But once I started playing, it just had such a, a grip on my imagination and it was so challenging. I mean, impossible, you know, and that appealed to me. Uh, when I'd been playing for just a few years, I had the opportunity to meet and play a lot of music with the man who at that time I believed was the greatest fiddle player who ever lived, a, a guy named Vassar Clements. Uh, well, who had come out of the bluegrass and country western music scene, but had just kind of exploded with sounds and ideas and an approach to the fiddle that had had literally never been heard before. Well, Vassar, for some reason that I, I still don't quite understand, really took me under his wing. We played together a lot and he, he would never, if we were doing a show together, he would never let me defer to him. And I was terrible at the time. I mean, I was very inexperienced. I, I was leading a band and I kind of knew how to do that. But my fiddle playing was very, uh, almost had no business being on stage at all. But Vassar would not let me just hand it off to him. You know, he made me hang in there and play. And my decision, song to song, was I could either take my solo before he played, or I would have to follow him, you know, which was completely impossible. So that was kind of the experience that, that, that launched me into taking this idea really seriously. If Vather Clements, the greatest who ever lived, thought I had something that should be developed, and was willing to take his time and energy and help me, then it was it was it was well worth pursuing. So that was kind of how I got started. Of all the whole places you played, was there one or two acoustically that stands out in your mind when you're performing that? Wow, we're gonna have a great time here. What what what? Sorry, what was the exact the first start of the question? Acoustically. What place really gave you a, not, a, a good bounce of, of sound coming out of here? Oh, oh, what, what venue? Oh, well, in San Francisco, the Great American Music Hall. Okay. Which had been a jazz club exclusively, really until my band with Vassar Clements played the first bluegrass show to headline that venue ever. And then that became just our our home base, uh, yeah, the Great American Music Hall. I, I can still close my eyes and hear what that room sounds like, you know. So, well, a long time since I played there, Stefan Grappel, uh, uh, he played with Sam Duval, Grand Music Hall, and Cal Basie, and, uh, and uh, Cal, uh, Duke Ellington played there. Are you familiar? Are you familiar with Stefan Grappel? I only got part of that. Stefan Grappelli. Grappelli. Oh, Stefan Grappelli. Yeah, I never met him, but I heard him play live many, many times, at least a dozen times. I never missed him when he came to the Bay Area. And he played the Great American Music Hall in San Francisco. So I got to hear him a lot. Uh, I wouldn't say he's an influence, a direct influence, because I'm not really a jazz player, but but he was an influence just to see somebody just swing his ass off like that, uh, of course, is just inspiring every time I saw him and every time I think about it. Did you know that? Where did you get your formal music education? Uh, I have no formal music education, uh, but as I like to say, I've stolen from the very best. <laughs> <laughs> All musicians do. Yeah, exactly. Did you know that Jack Benny was a great violinist. 
I, it's one I, I until I took up the violin, I didn't know that. But since then, I've seen virtually every video he made with, uh, you know, playing the violin and working with other sort of famous musicians, and they're hilarious. You, you know, he uh, he hi uh, yeah. He, Yasha Heifetz told Penny that he would take him as his first student. But he would not think he would have, this is a true story, evidently. I heard it from the guy who became Heifetz's first student, Eric Friedman. And Friedman, he, uh, he was told uh, you'd have to give up uh, everything else, and, and Benny wasn't going to do it. Would, oh, yeah. what, what I wanted to ask a couple of quick questions, Tom. Yeah. One about Bill. Did he take. Uh, as he started his career as a player, uh, did the glasses become an issue, or by that time was it a little bit more accepted? You know that that's a good question. I I, I wear glasses myself, and uh, my recollection is that Dad was actually one of the first players who had to wear glasses. I mean, he he couldn't see worth a damn without them. So again, I think that might have been something that would have been considered an impediment but but not for him you know he knew he needed the glasses and uh and so he wore them uh, maybe you guys know are there other glasses wearing players who predate well, well, well specs Spec talked the so the first but, there you but go. before for that the uh, uh, lee meadows was the first the first pitcher and he was a few years before Torkerson. Okay. And yeah. they all played the in St. Louis. And uh, Spex Maggio. to Forster. Yeah, okay. So there, there were a bunch. You know, I'm certain it was considered uh, something of a, of a handicap. But I, I am also certain that my dad's force of will, you know, would not have allowed, oh, a little thing like I can't see worth a shit, you know, to, to stand in his way. Uh, you know, speaking of glasses, I do, rem I do remember when my dad uh, was managing the Angels and he had Ryan Duran on his pitching staff. Oh, my God. And he God. had yeah. these really thick glasses. And what used to just crack me up is he would come into pitch and he'd be standing out there, look, you know, looking in at the, at the batter, and he'd sort of be looking around as if he wasn't quite sure where the plate was and where the, where the bat was actually standing. And then from time to time, he just let a fastball go, you know, like eight feet over the guy's head. You hear it crash into the head. And I don't know how anybody ever faced that man's fastball. It just must have been terrifying. Did you ever get down here to the Arizona area for spring training? Yes, yes. And did you ever uh, get to go to the Horace Stoneham Estate? No, I, I was, that was never a, no, never. Okay. So, Tom, I was always fascinated with the names of the Giants and, you know, in the 40s, uh, and Johnny Mai is certainly one of them. The other one was Clint Hartung. Oh, and, yeah. And, and they had these great names. And uh, speaking of Clint, did anybody ever tell you, uh, Tom, that you could be a Clint Eastwood stand-in? That's who I thought I was seeing. Uh, yeah. on the you're, 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 you're the Very first good. person since this meeting started but uh, <laughs> yeah i've been hearing that kind of my whole adult life it seemed to start when i was about 40 and just got more and more and more and more common uh i do have a slightly funny story about it uh, years ago i was playing a a fundraising event in uh, monterey county and this was when clint was the mayor of carmel yeah and he was the celebrity uh, MC of the show. So I arrived to start setting up my gear. The woman who was the kind of the promoter of the show saw me and did this double take and said, oh my God, and grabbed me and dragged me over to where Clint was standing talking to some, some fans of his, some people. And All right, I'll play around with the buttons. This woman just Marvin looked good too. up into Clint's face where, you know, he's talking here and blah, 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 blah. And this woman just sort of shoves me into his line of vision. And he looked over and did this double take and said, Jesus, the family's bigger than I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I thought that was a pretty good off the cuff. Um, I got a quick question for you. Uh, so 
So uh, your dad becomes the manager in San Francisco, first manager in, in 1958. And then he gets rehired in 76. Could you tell us about that experience? And were you, sure. happy, were you happy about that? Well, uh, the, the question is more, was he happy about it? Um, I, I don't know if you guys know the, the back story of all this, but the plan forever was that at some point, Horace would sell the team to Bob Lurie. Right. And Chubby Feeney would be the general manager. Lurie would be the owner and dad would be the field man. And that was their dream and their plan forever. So by the time Horace was finally ready to let go of the reins and sell the team, Chubb was the president of the National League and it would have been a conflict of interest for him to quit that job and become general manager of the Giants. So the the thing that those three guys who were very close friends, Lurie and Chubb and my dad, their their dream now was not going to happen the way they always envisioned it and, and hoped it would happen. So Lurie said, okay, okay, but you've got to come and be the manager, even though Chubb can't do this. And Dad was not crazy about it. He kind of wanted a different job. I think he thought maybe Lurie would give him the general manager job since Chubb wasn't available. And Bob said, no, no, I need you on the field. I need you on the field. I need you on the field. Manage for one year. And if you're not happy with it, you can have any job you want. And uh, so Dad agreed to it, had probably the the most unpleasant year he ever had as a manager because 76 was right when players started having agents to speak for them. And he had some kind of prima donna players who were very, very difficult to manage. Uh, and he was old school enough that he thought, you know, the manager's opinion and attitude and decision should not be questioned. And now he's working with a bunch of guys who not only question his right to be critical of them, but sometimes want somebody else to speak for them. You know, you can imagine how my old man felt about that. Anyway, so he managed for that one year. And then in the aftermath of that, yeah, you know, it didn't look like there was going to be a position in the Giants organization that my dad felt was desirable to him, was what he really wanted to do. And so he and Bob just parted ways. Thank you. You know, it was a pretty lousy team too. I mean, nobody wanted to be there. And Bob, was it that the team that Bobby Mercer rose on and Jack Clark said he can improve the stadium with dynamite? Yeah, yeah. And Montefusco, who was, you know, so good, but such a pain in the ass. No offense. Are you? Don't if he, tell me about it. I had to work in his, old, his biography for Sabre, and he was monumentally pissed at me. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah. so, so that was that, was that year. You know, it's an interesting thing. Um, that year, after my father and I had spent a, a few years being somewhat estranged from one another, for you know, no terribly important reasons, just we had gone our different directions. That was the year where one night when I was out having dinner with my parents, after we finished dinner, dad said, let's go out and drink a glass of wine out in the backyard. And I thought, whoa, this is unusual. He must want to talk to me about something. And for the first time ever, he, he needed to open up about his experience with this damn team he was trying to manage and the stuff that he was struggling with and the players and the agents and this and that and the attitude and a lot of that. And I, my dad had never talked to me about stuff like this. And so in the middle of it, I started saying, well, geez, dad, that's nothing, man. I've got this, I've got this female singer who, you know, when she's not front and center, she basically stands over to the side of the 
stage and glares at those of us who are playing solos. And, and then he would say, well, that's nothing. I've got a shortstop who, you know, a lot of the, and I'd go, well, that's nothing. You know, my bass player, right? I had to drag him out of the, you know. And suddenly the two of us stopped and looked at each other and thought, oh my God, we have the same job. <laughs> it was insane. I felt that I had spent eight years trying to get as far away from my father and his big shadow as possible. And, and now here we were talking like we had exactly the same problems. How do you take a group of supremely talented sensitive, neurotic, hyper prima donnas and mold them into either a functioning baseball team or a functioning uh, uh, musical ensemble. And it had never occurred to us before that we had become essentially the same person in our respective fields. So that was 1976. So Tom, my dad used to piss off Monty Fusco. Uh, he used to call him. He used to call him Count Monty F. O. You can fill in the rest of the F. <laughs> That's great. Hey Tom, yeah, I wanted to everybody. ask you about your musical beginnings. At what point were you? Did you think that music was going to become your career? You know, boy, uh, I, I think it was probably after playing with Vassar Clements. You know, for the first few times, I, I finally thought. Well, if I just keep doing this, maybe I'll get better enough to, you know, to, to make it work. Um, but it's such a, as with any skill that you're trying to master, it's such an ongoing everyday process sure. that you don't, you know, I, th there really wasn't a moment where I said, oh, this is it for me. I'm going to do this. This is how I'm going to provide for my family. You know, this is going to be my, my, uh, uh, there really wasn't a moment. There were just experiences that okay. resonated so deeply that it prevented me from thinking that anything else would be as interesting as playing music. And then next thing you know, you've been doing it for a few years and suddenly it's, it's working, you know, you're getting gigs, you're playing, people are clapping, they're buying your records, whatever it happens to be. And so before, before that, what kind of other types of jobs did you have before you decided to dedicate yourself to music? You know, I, 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 I came kind of right out of graduate school and uh, started playing the violin. So the only jobs I had were, were just menial. I need to make some money. So I'd work in a record store or I'd okay. work uh, doing you know, cool. yard work, gardening work or something for, for some months. I worked for the post office for a few months. I would use other jobs, but I, I never had another career. Once I started with music, I kind of gave up the direction I was heading in graduate school and, uh, and just devoted myself to playing music. And I never, for me, once I decided to play music, I didn't want to have a day job anymore. I really felt like it's only going to work if I put everything on the line. Mm. And again, I think that was a lesson that I kind of got from my dad. Okay. You know, you, 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 you do it. You don't worry about whether there's a fallback, whether there's a net. The only way you find out if you're good enough is you, you do it full on, full on, without hesitation, without reservation. So that's the approach that I took. Well, hey, Tom? Was your graduate school, Tom. Hey, What's Tom? that? Where, where was your graduate school? Where, where did you oh. go? Oh, uh, Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> that's a switch. What was your major? Uh, uh, fine arts. Uh, I have a master's degree in art history, uh, a, a BFA in, in painting and printmaking, and I was in the middle of uh, a PhD program. Uh, at Harvard when I first <coughs> bought a $50 violin and started scratching away on it. <laughs> Too bad you didn't go to high school of music and art with me. We would have been buddies. And there you go. See? Tom, did you ever come, come across Jerry Garcia? 
Of course, yeah. I even played with him once. Really? Uh, yeah. Again, well, back when I was playing bluegrass, uh, because we were we were Vassar Clements' backup band in the Bay Area for a while. Vassar had been in a band previously with Jerry Garcia and David Grisman, a band called Olden in the Way. And so Grisman was a friend of ours, and he would come play with us when Vassar was in town. And one night. He brought Jerry with him, and I actually have a recording of some song where Jerry's on stage playing banjo, and I'm singing a, some old bluegrass song, and at the end of the chorus, I hear myself say, take it, Jerry, <laughs> and Jerry Garcia plays a banjo solo, and I, when I hear that, I, it just kills me. I think, good God, I actually stood on stage with those guys. Uh, Tom, uh, may I ask, um, your father... We were discussing also a question for Ed If you could both ask. Experiencing an urgent medical issue, please hang up and call 911. You a new microphone. What did, well, I, I keep on switching from one to another, but what did your father decide how it was like working for Hanna? And this is a question for you and for Ed. Okay, what was it like working for Horace Stoneham? Uh, I, I I think my dad. Well, when he was a player, I don't. I I think Horace would have been sort of this big scary uh, owner guy that my dad wouldn't have uh, wouldn't have felt able to you know confront him on anything. When he was managing for him, Dad ran into problems with Horace just because Horace really liked being surrounded by what I think my dad used to refer to as his drinking buddies. <laughs> and dad wasn't one of his drinking buddies and Horace appreciated yes men surrounding him. And my father would never have been accused of being a yes man for anybody. He ran a, you know, a foul of, of uh, Charlie Finley in the same way when he worked briefly <laughs> for Finley. Um, so I, I think dad felt protected from Horace because Chubb was in the middle. And, you know, Chubb was Horace's nephew and was my dad's closest friend. So, so I think he didn't have a lot of direct confrontation with Horace, but, you know, when he got fired, the team was in second place. You know, it was just, it was just a move that Horace felt, he needed to make for some reason that had nothing to do with the quality of the team or even their performance at midseason. You know. Do you know, Jamie? Can I ask you about uh, maybe his greatest uh, uh, managing feat? It had nothing to do with the Giants. Uh, did he ever talk about the years with the Angels in '62 when the Giants had a great year? He absolutely turned around. The Angels yeah. made him a third place team. I mean, yeah. he got some credit for that, but that he, he did better with them than he ever did with the Giants. He took yeah. nothing, made them something. I, I think. I think in retrospect, Dad always said that. Well, you know, I mean, the the years with the Giants, of course, were oh, yeah. the fundamental years of his career. But as a manager, I think he enjoyed those early Angels teams the most of any teams he managed because they were so wacky. I mean, those were, that was a crazy bunch of players. Oh, yeah. And he had to, you know, the, the uh, L.A. press referred to him as Merlin. They stopped calling him Rig and just started calling him Merlin that whole 62 season yeah. because he was pulling shit off that, that was impossible. And he was doing it by – for, you know, he was one of the first guys to bring in a pitcher to pitch to one batter and then get him out of there before he had to pitch to the next guy, you know. And he was using the pitching staff in those ways. He was using pinch hitters. He was – it was like he was using this weird box of crayons that, that somehow kept resulting in, in very beautiful, you know, victories and uh, – I, I think he enjoyed the hell out of that because it taxed him. It tested him the most as a manager. Yeah. Thank you. 
Uh -huh. And to, uh, to uh, respond to the same question, I asked Tom about what his father felt about working for Horace Stoneham. Yeah, I think I didn't. I I think I addressed that. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Tom, are you, are you aware of Jamie Rupert's uh, drive to get Horace in the Hall of Fame? Do you? She's up there in the Bay Area. Do you know her? Have you met her? No, I no, I don't. I'm I'm not connected with her at all. How about Johnny Mathis? Have you? <laughs> he's up there too. Have you ever crossed paths with him? <laughs> Never <laughs> to him, but I'd like to. I love. He's a great singer. Tom, got I got, a I got another musical question for you, Tom. During uh, your long association with the Giants, did you ever play the anthem at Candlestick Park or uh, any of the uh, AT&T or what? whatever the name of the park is at the time. Uh, I, I never did, and I, I regret it. Um, I, uh, you know, they, they never asked, and somehow it just was, I, I, I'm not sure why that never happened. I, I probably could have had I pursued it, but I didn't. Uh, I did play the anthem for the A's one year, uh, after Dad died, they renamed the press room the Bill Rigney Press Room. Okay. And so on their home opener, they were going to uh, have a big ceremony, a naming ceremony, where they changed the name of the uh, press room. And my daughter, Annie, who was about, God, I don't know, maybe she was 10 years old at the time, uh, I had arranged, they had called to see about somebody throwing out the first pitch. And my daughter was pitching little league softball at the time. And so I said, no, you don't want me. You want my daughter, but I'll play the anthem for you. Well, you know, every year, every year at uh, AT&T Oracle Park, they have a uh, Grateful Dead night. That'd be most appropriate for you to be playing the national anthem on that. Play the anthem. I, I know. Well, right. when yeah. I did do it, I did it with just fiddle and drums and I did it as a New Orleans kind of second line marching band, just just fiddle and and a drummer. And it was it was very cool. But my daughter also had the experience of walking out in front of forty thousand people or something on opening day and throwing out the first pitch and, and it was it was great. Any more uh, questions that if somebody hasn't asked uh, yeah. anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. How was your experience at Seal? How was your experience at Seal Stadium? I loved Seal Stadium. I remember that place. Uh, I recently, somebody, I can't even remember where I, whether I, where I came across this. Oh no, I do remember. Somebody was talking about Willie. There was an article in the Chronicle about Willie. This is a few years ago. And there was a picture of Willie taken on opening day 1958 at seal stadium and here's willie you know he's not at the plate he's kind of standing swinging bats or something during batting practice and as i'm looking at this picture and seeing kind of the bunting along the the you know the the little wall you know where the people are sitting i'm looking past willie and very kind of fuzzy i'm seeing the people in the front rows of the audience and i suddenly went oh my god look at that and i ended up scanning the photograph and blowing it up and blowing it up and blowing it up and there i am with my mom my brother my sister my aunt i mean there we are like right in the front row and it was just insane to see that because i remember i i seeing it i remembered that experience so vividly opening day at seal stadium the first game in san francisco so yes i do remember it quite well Who did they play what team did they play uh, at that game no no that's that's a question great. you guys you want to get the dodgers the dodgers nothing ruben gomez right uh right. did you ever meet addy bazinski not the know of he, he, he was a violinist. He was with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Leo made him play the violin in the clubhouse. But, <laughs> and, but, but he wound up becoming a, a musician in Portland, Oregon, and he lived to, into his 90s. No kidding. Kinsky. Yeah. Never. Tommy, you mentioned uh, Grisman. 
Did you see him there? Yeah, there he is. You see, you see me yeah, on the side? David. Can you tell who's in the middle? You know, Dave Bromberg? Yes. Oh, there's David Bromberg. Yeah, I almost joined his band once. I came and in, he was auditioning fiddle players, and I came in second. And he, they did a benefit with us years ago. And the little kid at the bottom, he's, he's uh, 29 years old already. Yeah. Wow, nice. Yeah. Well, I knew, I knew both Davids, Bromberg and Grisman, when they lived in uh, Marin County. He signed the dog. See, he signed the dog. Yeah, yeah. Great. Hey, Tom. <laughs> Tom, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, I just want to make an acknowledgement. The, the memories that you recall for me, I, for many years, I saw Mel Ott play, uh, Ernie Lombardi, your father, Willie Mays. It was, it, they were great memories. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and when I was a kid of 19 years old, I had a team which I called the Cubs because I was a Cub fan. And on that team for two weeks, were San Francisco players Dom Zanny and Nick Testa, who I grew up with, who just played in one game. And um, I'm proud of that. Yeah. George, uh, I think you wanted to ask a question, George Gregor. Yeah, I think Richard Young, Tom, this is George. Uh, thank yeah, you. Yeah, hey, George. Good. Thanks for supporting the, uh, my book. Oh, and, uh, I, I love it, man. I, I show it to every baseball fan I know. So you got to see this. It's a history of the Giants in verse. <laughs> I know. It's the fifth of, of that kind of epic poem. Anyway, I think Richard Young has joined us. But before people drift away, I want to recommend highly uh, getting to know Flambeau, especially you folks on the West Coast. I wish you'd come east. We should come over on, on the East Coast one day and play out here. I, I wish I would too. You know, I, I kind of have to go where the, I, I don't do the kind of cross country touring where you get in the bus and drive all the way across and play gigs everywhere. So I kind of have to go where I, you know, the, the, the things I do on the East Coast or in the Midwest tend to be festivals where I just fly in, play for three or four days and fly home. Is, is, right Carolyn now. Dahl, is Carolyn Dahl still with you? She's one of the top honky tonk pianists you, you'll find anywhere. Absolutely, she's still with me. I can't, I can't shake her off. <laughs> hey Tom, if you, if you ever get to the East Coast, let us know. We'd love to come and hear you. Yeah. All right, well, you can always see where I'm playing. Uh, the website is tomrigney.com. So. I, will, okay. I will send that out to everybody. Tom, okay. one, of, one, of, one of our major goals this year will be to get you to play the anthem. So we know enough people. I think okay. we can make it happen. Maybe we can make it happen. <laughs> we will. Okay. Cool. Uh, what a great evening. Let's give it all up to uh, Tom Rigby. Great night. Hey, thank, thank you, Tom, you. very much. What a great night. You guys, you, guys want, you guys want to hear one more story that I know you haven't oh, heard? Yeah. Sure. Go ahead. Right. One more. You know, uh, Dad, as you know, was famous as a storyteller, and, and it's delightful always to hear him tell his stories. But at his memorial, Mike McCormick told a story that I had never heard, that nobody had ever heard, and it wasn't one of my dad's stories. It was from a player's perspective. So, and I thought it captured the, uh, the, the role and the whatever, the vibe of the manager, as well as any story I've ever heard. So the team is on the road, let's say, in Philadelphia. And any time there was a day game following a night game, the players had a very strict curfew back in the hotel, you know, in your room, lights out, la da 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 by such and such a time. Let's say it was midnight. I think it was midnight. So now they've had the night game. Now we're at the park the following day, you know, arriving early for batting practice before a day game. And my dad suits up and comes out into the clubhouse and he looks at everybody assembled, calls a little meeting. And he said, uh, listen, I happen to know 
that several of you were out after curfew last night. <laughs> and if you cop to it, just raise your hand, acknowledge that you were one of the people out after curfew last night. That'll be the end of it. But if you don't cop to it, I'm going to fine you $50. And, you know, that was some money in those days. And so he looks around the room and everybody's, mm, you know, no, no, nobody, no guilty people here. And my dad says, okay, okay, listen, I happen to know that seven of you were out after curfew last night. I'm going to make you the same offer. Just cop to it. And that's the end of it. But if you don't, I'm going to fine you $50. And he looks around again and, and still everybody's, you know, looking up at the wall and looking here and there. Nobody says a word. At which point he reaches into his back pocket and pulls out a baseball. The night before, when he had gotten back to the hotel, he got in the elevator and said to the elevator operator, uh, excuse me, sir, are, are you a baseball fan? Oh yeah, Mr. Rigney, I'm, I'm a big fan. God, I, I see as many games as I can. My dad says, oh, that's great. Uh, well, do you happen to know any of my Giants players? And they guys, oh, Mr. Rigney, we're so thrilled that you guys stay at our hotel. You know, I, I know all your players. You know, I, I just love the fact that you guys stay here at our hotel. My dad says, okay, well, would you do me a favor then? And he takes out a baseball and hands it to this guy and says, if any of my players come in to your elevator after midnight tonight, would you ask them for their autograph? <laughs> uh, uh, thanks so much, Tom. Give another round of applause, Tom Rigney. Thanks, Tom. Woo!